of expectations as we also receive brand new mercies. We pray this now in the miraculous, mighty, marvelous name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, and returning Redeemer. And wherever you find yourself, why don't you say amen? Amen. Look, we're grateful tonight. Uh, this past Sunday, if you were with us at Piney Grove East, I know many of you uh, follow us virtually. Many of you were in person with us uh, this past Sunday. Uh, but if you weren't, you know, uh, Sunday was Pentecost Sunday across this globe. And uh, those 40 days after uh, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we celebrate uh, the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit have come and we were all in one place. Our scripture says they were all in one place and on one accord. And because of being in one place on one accord, as we shared on Sunday, uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit is not just to allow us to speak in tongues, lay hands on folk, uh, but I believe the true gift is to equip us for evangelism. Because if you look at that text, and I'm not going to re-preach a sermon um, there in Acts of the Apostles chapter two, you see where it talks about they spoke those that were speaking spoken other known languages. So it's like right now, if I just break out in French or German, never took a French German class, but I'm just speaking it fluently. That's what the Holy Spirit came to do then for them. And because of us now today, that is saying to me, my interpretation is that I need to be able to speak who Jesus is and the importance of salvation, the importance of our faith to be able to communicate that not only to uh, the other scholars in the ivory tower at Duke University, Harvard, Yale, wherever I may find myself, but I can also speak it in a way that the person on the corner that's slinging dope, selling crack, uh, they can understand and it's relevant to them. So no matter where we find ourselves or where to, no matter where we find people, that we can still speak who Jesus is and help them to understand that we don't have to speak just loftiness and uh, big theological terms, but we can speak it in a way uh, that people can hear and understand and be receptive to who Jesus is in their own terms in their own language. And so that's what I feel the Holy Spirit was sent to do. And that's what's led us to this book. Uh, I read this uh, months ago, the post quarantine church is helping us with evangelism. Uh, where I pastor, where I serve rather, uh, Piney Grove East, um, 10 years ago, uh, when I was called to this ministry, uh, I stood on two verses of scripture. Those verses of scripture are found in the 43rd chapter of Isaiah. And I probably could read them verbatim or at least paraphrase them, but I'm going to read it uh, from the New Revised Standard Version, Isaiah 43. That's going to be the scripture tonight. And then we're going to talk about uh, just an introduction to this book. And we're just going to hit on challenge number one as we see there are six urgent challenges. So I hope you got your Bible because you're going to need that right now. Hope you got your pen or something, something to write with, highlight or some, uh, some paper. Uh, take notes as we talk about evangelism. Um, Isaiah 43 verses 18 and 19. The word of the Lord says, do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. Why? God's saying, I'm about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? Y'all don't see it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Now, I've been standing on that since May of 2010, and I'm still standing on that 10 years later because I believe this pandemic is now God is about to do a new thing. As I was having conversation uh, this past week uh, with colleagues uh, from around um, the country, there is a demonic attack against the church and her leadership. The enemy wants to do whatever it can in. Because here, here's here's where I want to challenge people, and I'm 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 a, this is lining us to where we are, are headed for tonight. The enemy knows if you're a pastor like me, um, we didn't get trained in seminary to handle a pandemic. Let alone even if we did get trained, we never knew we would face one. And many pastors became weary throughout the pandemic the stress of what pastors had to endure and still having to endure post quarantine, not post pandemic, is, is unknown to most people. The weight that a lot of pastors carry, that's why you know, the, the world was 
having this what's been dubbed as the great resignation, right? Uh, where people were changing jobs, quitting jobs, starting companies, all these different things um, in that secular space. But now you have so many pastors, even those that might have been in full time ministry that have joined that great resignation because there was so much stress. And now that your pastors are back, there's all this demonic presence that is coming against God's church, right? And it's not just local. It's not just regional. It's it's an attack of the enemy because the enemy knows that pastors are weary and some are weak right now. And if I can continue to attack them and beat them down, what that'll do is I keep is people keep leaving the church, meaning pastors and leaders, what that'll do to the church universal. We know the church is not ours. The church is God's. We know that if something were to happen to the church in uh, the future, God's already got the next thing in place ready for the church. But what we can do, especially those of us who are pastoral leaders, to help equip not only our congregations, but those that are looking at the church those that are looking at the world, how can we position ourselves in such a way to better serve the people and speak their language in this world that we're living in today? So that's what's led us to look at this post-quarantine church to help give us some some help in understanding there's some urgent challenges as uh, Tom Rayner, author of so many little great nuggets of books, who moved my pulpit? I am a church member. So I can go on and on and on. Um, but so much can be gleaned from these. And I just want to share some of the things uh, that we have gleaned that can hopefully be helpful for us. And we'll do that over the next uh, few weeks through the remainder of the month of June, because uh, in July, uh, Pine and Grove East has their cessation. And so I'm going to be doing some other teaching during that time on my own platforms, but we'll be taking a break as far as our uh, church's platforms. And so you'll still be able to find it uh, in other spaces. Post-quarantine church, Tom Marina, let's jump in. We're just talking about challenge one tonight. Uh, As we get to the end, it's not a lot that you have to um, keep up with, but as we end tonight, next week, uh, we'll have challenges two and three. And we'll show those on the last slide there. Uh, but let's let's jump right in, because what, what this book is trying to help us understand, it's got, it gives us, and if you haven't picked it up, you can do that. I think they may be accessible. I know they are accessible on Amazon. I'm not sure the price now, maybe $10, $15, somewhere in that price range. Well worth your read and your resources and your time, as we say, time, treasure, and talent. Uh, it's well worth that to be able to, to pick this book up. But it's, it's a summary of what to expect post-pandemic of what churches may look like. And, and some people understand that churches, like we just read Isaiah 43, don't remember former things or the things of old. Why? Because God says God is about to do what? A new thing. And we don't need to stifle, stop, or minimize this new thing that God is up to because we can't stop it. We can't. And, I, and I'm jumping ahead of myself. This wasn't a surprise. And because this pandemic wasn't a surprise, we can't stop what God is up to because we couldn't stop what we entered into in March of 2020. And, and here's, here's the reality, y'all. At the end of the day, as you look at your churches, many of them, dare I say most of them, don't look like what they look like physically when we left in March of 2020. People aren't, as many people aren't worshiping in person. People aren't taking the time to come to life studies on a Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, whenever you may have your worship. People are just doing things and we got to find new ways to be able to help people and, and serve people. And so that's, that's why it is helping us and this book will help us. And, and it's not a long read. It's, it's, it offers us some help. Whoever takes some, some um, time to read it, some help. It offers us some hope that it's easy for us to understand some practical ways to navigate through uh, as we hopefully are ushering out this pandemic. Uh, now, uh, community, 
levels are going up. I know where I serve in Union County um, was low. Now it's medium. Where I live in Forsyth County, it was medium. Now we're in high, we're in orange. Uh, the transmission rate that is happening within our community is COVID is still happening. And so we're still in the pandemic. It's not over just because as many people are not dying from it does not mean people are still does not mean people are not still dying. It does not mean people are not getting sick because they still some are still dying and many uh, are getting sick. So we want to jump in. So let's just jump in. I won't keep you long tonight. I want to jump in, give you a little short little summary. Um, but I want to talk about what Rainer does uh, first. To kind of introduce us before we get into the first challenge, as you know, there will be significant differences in churches post quarantine. Now, notice I'm not saying or using the phrase post pandemic because we're still in a pandemic, but we are now post quarantine. Y'all remember, y'all remember at the onset when most of us were going crazy because we had to stay in the house, we couldn't run here, couldn't go there, that was shut down, this was shut down, uh, church was shut down, and, and, and there are going to be significant differences post-quarantine. We should notice that, especially locally at our church, there are things and things that, I, that, that leaders have put in place, and I can only use me for an example, of safety precaution. Uh, for not only those who are in church, but those who will we who we will see after church. And so there's a significant difference when you go in churches now. You see how we have um, uh, pews roped off. So we're sitting still social distancing, uh, sitting uh, every other pew. And so that's something we've never had to do before. Some people may have had to do it because of the, the attendance numbers, but many of us aren't able to, do, you know, weren't, weren't doing that. So there's significant differences. We look at now how, uh, for some people, the worship experience has changed because when uh, pastors were preaching to empty pews and empty churches, uh, pastors weren't online for two hours. Amen. <laughs> because, you know, pastors necessarily, a lot of us weren't hooping, uh, and, and especially if you're in the Baptist tradition, uh, closing hard and heavy uh, because it was empty pews. And so we had to adjust our preaching styles and, and, and things that came along with that. So there are significant differences. The, the time we spend in church, what takes place in that worship moment, how we utilize the time, that it doesn't take two hours. The, the pandemic taught us it doesn't take necessary. And I'm not knocking nobody. I don't think I'm in here trying to talk about folk that's in church two hours. That's not what I'm talking about. But some of us who may have been in church for an extended period of time realize it didn't take all of that in order to accomplish the same thing. And so um, there, there's differences how we go about doing things are different. We realize communication is different because we couldn't meet up on Sunday morning, grab a program, read the announcement. So we had to figure out ways to do that, ways to save money. So we're, we're uh, doing phone calls, doing text messages, doing emails, doing Facebook posts, doing videos, all these different things to still try to get the word out in a way that it could still be impactful. So, so we gotta realize things are changing. I realize, you know, you go to the workforce. There are many companies who learned when we talk about how things have changed in the world. Many companies learn, wait a minute. For a lot of companies, they got more work out of their employees working from home than they did coming to an office five days a week. So many companies have said, hey, work remotely permanently. Or, you know, you may work in office too three at the most days a week and you work remote for a couple of days a week. They saw the productivity of the work increase by people being home and having that flexibility. But it's the church that feels we 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 know church is relational, right? We we talk about we use that that scripture about don't forsake the assembling of ourselves. We get that there are moments where we need to do that, but there are moments also where we can still benefit. Like I pray you're benefiting from this teaching tonight that it can be done in a way that you might be outside walking right now listening to me. You you might be um uh at a at a at a uh soccer game, baseball game. I don't know somebody, nothing's really happening and you're watching me right now. It may be that you couldn't get to church at seven o'clock on a Wednesday evening and stay till eight 
to receive this, but now it could be eight, six a.m. Thursday morning, and you can be watching this and still get to say, so, so there are the things that we got to adjust and know that there are going to be significant differences, and it's not for the worse or not for the bad. It, it's for the good, right? It'll take more time, or it'll take time, rather, before we really begin to understand what this new era will look like. One of the terms, especially that I use throughout the pandemic, the, the, the height of the pandemic was fluid, right? Meaning things can change at the drop of a dive, drop of a hat, uh, but we gotta be fluid in order to, to move as they change. And truth of the matter is because churches now, many churches are uh, meeting back in person. I know some churches have had to deal with outbreaks and make adjustments. I know we haven't had an outbreak, but we made adjustments so that we don't have a, a potential spread from our church. And there's things that every church has to do because every church is different. But because it's still changing, because people are still on the fence, am I going to come back to church? Am I going to keep watching virtual? Am I going to leave the church altogether? We don't know the level of commitment for some people yet. There's still a whole lot of time that we got to figure out what this new church or this new era is going to look like. We, we, we don't know yet because we don't know what church we have, right? Because some people were still in a pandemic. I know even for me, I have some seniors that are part of our church. They give, they, they support as best they can, but they still haven't been back to in-person worship yet. And, and you got to understand, it's okay for them to feel that way. You try to do what you can to give them encouragement to know everything as far as safety uh, parameters and protocols have been put in place. But we got to understand, it's going to take some time for some people. Some people may not come back till the fall. Some people may not come back at all, but they'll support you online. Whatever the case may be, we can't negate, we can't, can't uh, punish people. We can't uh, tear people down. We can't make negative comments because of them not being ready. We got to understand until we know and understand more what's that going to look like, what people are going to look like, how folks are going to act, where people are going to be supportive. We really don't know. And it's going to take time. And that's why I say that the demonic attack that is going against leaders and leadership is because as leaders are trying to figure this out, trying to figure out where's what's the next step, what's the what, what's the best move, what's the next move, the enemy is trying to do what it can so that pastors and leaders of churches and ministries won't have that opportunity to be able to have time to figure out what's next, to pray as they're figuring out. The enemy wants to do everything it can so that it doesn't have time, so that leaders don't have time to strategize. And as I already said before, that I'll say one more time, none of this caught God off, and none of this is a surprise. None of this caught God off guard. The pandemic didn't catch God off guard. Everything that we're dealing with we got to understand God already knew. And the reason God already knew, going back to Isaiah 43, 18 and 19, it is now time. Y'all hear me good on a Wednesday night. It is time for us. And I'm speak, I can only speak for Piney Grove East, but I'm, I'm also speaking to the church universal. It is time for us to enter into this new land of possibilities. And we, be, we need to be able to do into that land of new possibilities with, with hope, with promise, and with enthusiasm. And the enemy doesn't want that to happen, that enthusiasm. So the enemy is trying to do whatever it can to get people bogged down so that that enthusiasm about what this new thing, this new land that God, these new ways, these rivers in the desert and ways in the wilderness, the enemy's doing what it can because of the, the new thing God is up to and knowing that God will do it. And God has done it. And because God has done it, God can do it again. The enemy's doing what it can to stifle that. None of this caught God off, um, caught God off guard. None of this caught God by surprise. And because of that, that means God has something in store. If we just continue to trust God as we trusted God through these two and a half years now of the pandemic, if we keep trusting God, 
God has something for us in this new land, and we need to do what we can to enter into it with hope, with promise, and enthusiasm. Let me give you challenge one, and I'm going to get out of here for uh, tonight. Challenge number one, or chapter one, however you want to categorize it. Chapter one of the book, or the first challenge Raina talks about is that we need to gather differently and better. Gather differently and better. Here's the first thing. We need to use or the use of facilities for greater and more efficient purposes. Now, one of the things that we're talking about evangelism, right? That's what that's why we're hitting on this because we're trying to we're trying to figure out ways of reaching our community. It used to be a time when, when people would evangelize that you would go door to door. You might have a door hanger, might have a little bag, you put on the door handle or whatever, have a little church information, knock on folks' door and keep going, walking through the neighborhood. That model for some, I'm not going to say most, but that model for some is not uh, an, an example anymore <laughs> because you just can't, first of all, decide to walk through some people's neighborhoods. Some people have no solicitors and, and it, all that kind of stuff in the neighborhood. You can't go through there anyway. But also the safety of people, because so many people are on high alert, knocking on somebody's door. You don't know where they are mentally on the other side. And they may think just because of the divided world of the racism that we have, they may think, oh, if say, say it's a it's a Caucasian person that you're going to their house and they may see an African-American. We don't know where the mind frame is. It could be a threat. Right. And, and vice versa. It could be an African-American person's uh, home and a Caucasian person comes and because whatever we've got that preconceived thought in our mind of assumption, we say, oh, I'm not, you know, so we so safety is a thing. So going door to door necessarily for some is not an option anymore. And so we got to figure out new ways of how we evangelize and reach people. And one of the ways for those at the church or at a church is through facility. We discovered, or some, many have discovered, I can't speak um, generally, but many leaders have discovered that our facilities sit, I mean, our churches, our uh, fellowship halls, our family life centers, our community resource centers, our uh, parsonages, our dining halls, our classrooms, go on and on our campuses. A lot of them are sitting empty other than for one or two hours on Sunday morning or maybe one or two hours during the week for either Bible study or choir rehearsal. And so collectively, some churches out of a week may only be open four or five hours throughout the week when you have this abundance of hours that is there. So trying to figure out ways that facilities can be used uh, gr for greater and a more efficient purpose. If somebody needs to hold a community meeting, open the church. If some company needs space because they can't afford rent somewhere else, open the church or let them utilize space. Got to start thinking that because the community will understand, oh, wait a minute, this church is trying to give options for people that have seemingly run out of options. And if it's a space that's just sitting there, there's has to be ways that we can utilize. The same thing goes for um, our vehicles, right? A lot of churches have church vans, 12 passenger, 15 passenger, 20 plus passenger vehicles. And they're just sitting there other than for a lot of them on Sunday morning. And then we, we, we saw Sunday morning was different because we couldn't go pick up folk. And so uh, finding ways to utilize our vehicles during the week. There are people that we might have, um, that especially in rural areas, right? We, I'm just trying to throw this out there for somebody. In rural areas, there are a lot of people that rely on 
county transportation because they don't necessarily have public transit systems. And so the county has a transit authority or transit system or something that they can use vans and go around and pick up people on a certain schedule, but they only have so many drivers. They only have so many vans. They only allow so many routes. They only pick up at so many stops. And churches can maybe figure out a way to say, hey, we got our vans just sitting here. Maybe we can do some of that kind of stuff to help people get to the grocery store, help people get uh, to the doctor's office. So many different things, right? So we got to understand there's a greater and more efficient purpose of what God has gifted us with because the church is the, phys- the church. Universal is not ours. It's God. The physical church, guess what? As much as we give, as much as we put our name on the pew, on the window, on, on, the, on the wall, is not ours. It still belongs to God, and we need to do whatever we can to share with others these gifts that God has entrusted to us for such a time as this. And the question that leads me to, what if we view church facilities as a tool to reach the community and thought of ways to bring the community in instead of keeping them out? Because we know, you know, not talk, we, we make sure everything is locked, got a gate, can't use a parking lot. I remember um, years ago, I uh, can't remember the year at uh, this point, I won't give the automaker name because I don't want to get in any trouble. Um, I remember there was an, a, an, a, a European auto car maker who was uh, filming a commercial and in our area, you know, we, our, our church is in a very rural area, a lot of winding roads, a lot of green, uh, pretty uh, scenery uh, on the sides. And um, they needed some place to put all their equipment, need some place to put all their trucks, need somewhere to set up a, a space so that persons, the, the team, the staff, um, could have their food when they needed food, need somewhere to put all these nice European cars that they were going to be utilizing in the commercial. And so um, for whatever reason, it led them uh, to us. And we could have said, no, no, you can't use our parking lot. Our parking, no, no, it's church parking lot. You can't use that. No, it was an opportunity to say, hey, this is going to be on television. This is going to be, may not know where it is when people see the commercial, but they just need to, our parking lot is just sitting here. (laughs) It's just sitting here. And these, this company wants to come in, utilize it and say, hey, people can come in, people can, we can utilize this and do this. So I'm sharing that to say, we can start thinking of those ways. We got parking lots that are just sitting there. We got church buildings that are sitting there. What if we began, and that's what Rainer talks about in uh, this first chapter. There's an instance where a church was declining, a church was was attendance giving a building, and they decided to begin to utilize their fellowship hall space as more or less a community center to offer birthday parties, right, to the community. And so that became such a thing uh, children's birthday parties more so more specifically than just birthday party that became so much so that the community realized this church is concerned about youth and children and utilizing this space what place and what that could do to know to say hey whether a church is declining or not but you know when you go rent spaces especially for parties um they're not cheap and if you could still have a safe space ample parking uh, all the same amenities Granted, you may not allow the same things to come in, but most of the time, let's say if it's a children's party in particular, you're not going to allow alcohol and certain music and all that to come in anyway. Uh, But church surely shouldn't allow those things. And so, um, but if people still want to have parties, meaning, you know, children's parties or whatever, why not utilize those spaces, especially when they're just sitting there? And you, you might be, somebody might be five or 10 minutes away from your church, but then because they got to go find a, a space like this, they got to travel 30 plus minutes in a neighboring town or, or city to be able to do the same thing. So, so viewing our church as a tool for the community uh, to reach people versus keeping them out, because keeping folk out right now is what a lot of churches had done or they were doing, right? Uh, and I'll get to that in my last little bullet. Um, 
but we want to reach people. We want people to know um, our church in particular over the past couple of weeks, as I shared Sunday, talking, we were talking about Pentecost and talking about being on one accord in one place and speaking in other known languages. Um, there are people, the world, our country, our community, notice how I started here and brought it even closer to home, are hurting. Hurting mentally, we're hurting physically, we're hurting in, for some, a financial way that they've never experienced before. I don't know about, I went, went to the gas pump. Now, if you, if, a lot of folk, most, a lot of people aren't like me. Uh, I'm filling up two, three times a week. <laughs> uh, I was reading an article about gas and it said the average American um, has, it was like 562, I think, but it was 500 some odd gallons of gas a year. That's the average American. I laughed at that because I'm like 500 gallons. I may do that in a couple months, let alone a year, but um, gas is not cheap. I looked at diesel. Diesel is like $6. For some of us, gas, depending upon where you what what you use, uh, regular, mid-grade, or premium, gas is five dollars a gallon. And so people are hurting because they're having to discover or having to decide: do I do this or do I put gas in my car? Do I get that or do I put gas in my car? My wife and I don't have babies anymore. Our old, youngest, rather, is four. But I look at the TV screen, and then I look at the shelves, and I see that this baby formula shortage is a real thing. There's a um, 84% of stores in North Carolina were out of baby formula. And for some, you got to realize some mothers aren't able to nurse in it, them, themselves. To, to feed their children. They rely on the formula and to have those shortages. People are hurting. And so our church a couple of weeks ago gave away a uh, hundred plus boxes of food. Now it wasn't processed food. It wasn't prepackaged food. It was fresh food, meaning fresh produce, fresh fruit, and fresh meat. Cause people need to understand there's a difference between process and fresh, right? Um, because people are hurting. Because I don't know about you, I go to the grocery store too, and I pay attention to good sales. That's every, everything that goes in our cart is is a is a, a I was gonna say is a Vic. That's what Harris Teeter has. An MVP. That's what uh, a Food Line has. Um, whatever the case may be, it's on sale <laughs> because grocery prices are getting ridiculous. And you might say a hundred boxes, hundred plus boxes, not a lot. But if we can help people with one or two meals to know we help save them a little money. And some may have stretched that beyond one or two meals because of what was so included in those boxes. Helped last week, able to give away $3,000 worth of free medical assistance for people with uh, medical prescriptions. People are hurting. People that might have Medicare, they, they, they don't necessarily have to worry about prescriptions in that way or in any type of good insurance, private insurance plan. They might have zero copays, you know, whatever the case may be. At the end of the day, there are people who don't have those luxuries and they need some type of assistance. And we were able to bless, people are hurting. And if the church begins to speak the language, other known languages, I get myself in trouble with this, but I'm okay with it. I grew up in an era, and probably you, if you're watching me tonight, grew up in an era. Without preaching the resurrection, I wouldn't, we wouldn't, I wouldn't have a gospel to preach. You wouldn't have a gospel to believe. That, that's what we stand upon. That's what our faith, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of one Jesus Christ who is alive and well and is not 
dead who's seated on the right hand of the father interceding for you and me that's the hope right that that's the gospel and and if you're in a baptist church if you grew up in one you know then you know when when to save a sorry sermon <laughs> go, go to the cross and i say that to say we hear a sermon we hear that same message we can hear it sunday after sunday and we get excited uh he died to the moon drifting blood. I'm gonna get my hoop in. Oh, he died to the earth reeled and rocked like a drunken man. Oh, he died to the centurion said, surely he must be the son of God, right? But he didn't stay dead because early Sunday morning, he got up with all power. Y'all, y'all know we that, that's not something that I just preach. I believe that. I get excited when I hear that. You get excited when you hear that because you know that's what our faith is built on. But I promise you this one thing tonight. There is a generation of people who are coming up today that as we get excited when we hear that because we know what that means to our faith, we know what that means uh, to in, in, in our hearts, we know what that means to our salvation, there are a group of people that are sitting there and saying, that's good. I believe it. I get, I'm, I'm thankful for the resurrection. But now that he's up, how is that going to help me feed my child? Now, now that he is up, how is that going to help me put gas in my tank? Now that he is up with all power in his hand, how is that going to help me when I look at my medical bills, when I look at my gas bill, my electric, how is that going to help me? And we as believers need to do what we can to help speak other known languages. That's evangelism. That's mission. That's helping people, meeting them where they are. It's good for us to shout and gather in church, but it's good to be outside to realize and hear the needs of people and try to help provide. And if we can't provide a tangible blessing, we can certainly provide a spiritual one through prayer. During quarantine, I got to get y'all out of here. Uh, many leaders and members discovered that the church was still the church, even without its building. Um, I don't know about you. I, our church tried to do a lot to keep people engaged. <laughs> uh, realizing, yes, the feeling may be different to be seated in the space, to see the person. But I'm gonna tell you something, that there are many churches that already had this model that are thriving and that people are maturing spiritually and in their discipleship. And what I mean by that is there are churches that may have had music, may have had a band, but when it was preaching time, they may have come to the church and view the preaching moment on a screen. They came, they heard, they worshiped, they praised, they sang, and then it was time for preaching. They watched it in a space together on the screen. It, it, it baffles me at times that we always can find something wrong, especially to complain about in church. Now, I, I don't know about you, I don't like a lot of noise. Maybe that comes with age. <laughs> as, as you get older, maybe you don't, maybe you don't like a lot. I don't like a lot of noise. I, I like silence. That's why a lot of times I, I like to stay up late because our house is quiet. Outside is quiet. They're not necessarily cars coming up and down the street. Um, and so I like quietness. And but in in in, in that quietness. I start to think of what I do like and what I don't like. And what the reason I talked about quietness, I, I don't like going, I might go to a game here and there um, when I have time, but also you gotta have the money. But anyway, what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to get to, the NBA finals are happening now. I, I was reading something where uh, when the Eastern final game seven uh, was in Boston before now the, the NBA finals, 
to get a room at a courtyard by Marriott for that night of that game seven, it was $2,300 for the room. I, I ain't got to the ticket for the game. If you got $2,300 for a courtyard at Marriott room, plus whatever the ticket price was for the game, I'm sure it was three digits all the way in the nosebleeds, if that. Most people watch the game at the house and they screamed and hollered and yelled and got up out of their seat and fussed at that TV like they were sitting there. Because it's the next best thing. Think about the Super Bowl. When Super Bowl happens, people plan because many folk can't get there, don't know, you know, even where it is at the cost to get there. So they plan, right? They plan what people are gonna bring for food, what drinks are gonna be there, who they're gonna invite, what time we're gonna start, what time the fish is gonna start frying, what time the grill is gonna start popping. And everybody comes in to watch a screen and they enjoy a great time together. Why, why is it that we find ways to complain about the church being that way when we can put the same effort to get the same reward? I'm helping somebody tonight. We people understood that the church was still the church even without the building. You can still put that same planning on Sunday morning. When we were sitting at home and we were watching virtually, we could have went and put on our button up shirt. We could have tied our tie. We could have put on our suit. We could have had our bad church hat on and our heels and came and sat in front of the TV ready to receive a word from God. But we found ways to just complain. Oh, it's not the same oh i don't got this or no we don't want to do that oh i don't feel right yeah but it's something that had to happen and now we learn from it because beloved there are people who are joining churches and even our church at piney grove East, that may never come to the physical building but they join us each week online they, they, they may never come and it's like if we didn't have that opportunity we may have never connected with those people all I'm trying to get us to understand, we can still be the church without the building. And as we're leading, going to evangelism, that's my hope and my prayer that we're going to lead to a place where we say, you know what, we're going to give this virtual option, but we're also, we're getting ready to go out here and be hands and feet today. We're going to reach people. We're going to speak their language. We're going to connect with folk on Sunday mornings in our communities because there are people who need us. There are people who need to know, yes, we like to get together and, and worship collectively, communally, but we also want to reach our community. Here's my last thing, and I'm done. I promise you, kept you too long. Our facilities are more tools than necessities, meaning we don't have to have them. We learned that during the pandemic. You couldn't go in. Uh, they're a tool, so it's good to have, but you, you don't. it's not a necessity. What I mean by that, I, I was doing some yard work uh, last week and uh, had this 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 weed or these these three weeds that had taken. I mean, th these were some strong weeds that had taken root in one of our flower beds. And I realized in that moment I had one of one of the things I had, I had a shovel because my my the little hole that I had. Um, won't do it. So I had a shovel car. I had to dig, try to dig down underneath that thing to, to get to that root and start breaking it up. But I realized, even though I had the tool of the shovel, I didn't need the shovel because at the end of the day, for me to get that root out, I still had to use these. I still had to bend down, dig in that earth and pull out those roots because that was a necessity. What am I telling you this for? The church is a tool. It's not saying we don't need it. It's not saying we don't need to utilize it. It's not saying it doesn't have its purpose. We know better, but we are saying we don't need to look at it as a necessity. We need to look at it as one of the tools God has given us to reach people. And because we look, and when we look at it rather as a tool, we will then understand we have other tools that we can use, other avenues as well, along with the church to still fulfill and satisfy what we've been called to do. That we can see the building more as a tool for outreach 
rather than a club. I know you can't see it, but rather than a club for members, because that's the truth of the matter for a lot of churches. Churches have become social clubs, country club for the church folk. Amen. You know, that, that's what a lot of churches have become, social clubs. Hey, how y'all doing? Good to see y'all. Yeah, yeah, y'all, y'all do the yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I didn't know y'all had it going on. Yeah, yeah, social club. Come to my church instead of come so that we can worship God together. It's a tool of outreach. I'm, please know I'm, I'm talking. Because see, here's the thing. When you start talking about mine, what's mine, that's why I say I, I don't pastor where I, I am. I serve because I know at the end of the day, it's not mine, it's not the people's that I serve, it's God's. And so when I understand that it's not mine and it's God's, no matter what I do or no matter what I endure, it still belongs to God. And so when I understand when church becomes a club, for a certain group of people and they want to keep because you know when you you know I, I can't afford to um have any club memberships right now <laughs> and may never be able to I don't know I'm not going to speak that into my life but you know country clubs I'm thankful I have friends <laughs> that may have these memberships and because of my connection with them I have access oh that's a word right there but I ain't gonna mess with that but I don't necessarily have it. But people turn their churches because they may give an offering. They may give some of the tithe. Amen, somebody. They may give, but they turn into, because I pay, I can do this. No, baby girl, no brother man. At the end of the day, this is the Lord's church. And we're, the giving is the obedient part. And so we got to understand, we can't turn this into our little club. This is a tool for outreach to know, don't come to my church. Come with me so that we may worship God together. And when we understand that, when we understand that because of this quarantine, not, not the pandemic, that this time of quarantine that we were away from church, away from one another, when we are back now, if we're gathering differently, because if we go back to doing the same thing, y'all, we're missing what God is up to. God didn't allow that. To, I can't speak for God. Please don't think I can. But it's my belief that 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 didn't happen for us to say, let's stop. Now let's go back to doing what we were doing. No, God is bigger than that. I'm about to do a new thing, says the Lord. Don't you perceive it? Don't y'all see it? That's what God is saying. Don't you see it? And beloved, at the end of the day, I want to do what I can as a pastoral leader to help not just the church, but the body of Christ to understand God is doing a new thing. And because God is doing that new thing, I want to be a part of it to see what God is going to continue to do. Next week, next week, join us next week. We're going to try to touch on two. I don't know if I'll be able to do that because I didn't know uh, just one uh, chapter, one challenge is going to take this long, but um, I'll try to get two in next week. We'll see because I want to do all six. Uh, give you two this week, two the following week, and one in the conclusion on the last Wednesday of the month uh, before we take our summer uh, cessation for July and August. So I'll try to do my best. But next week, we're going to try to talk about seize your opportunity to reach the digital world and uh, chapter three, reconnect with the community near your church. Um, talking about outreach, talking about evangelism. God's about to do a new thing. We want to meet people where they are and we want to speak to them in other known languages. So be able to speak to them, speak their language, even though it might not be ours. Thank you so much for joining us on this Wednesday night. I pray you've been blessed uh, by the teaching. Pray that it gave you some type of insight, something to prick your mind as you begin to pray uh, for your local church. If you're not connected with us here uh, at Piney Grove East, you may be connected to a local church and you can start think of uh, asking God to give you some, in some, some innovation that you can share with your leadership, share with your pastor, that God is saying, think of ways that your church uh, could partner with different uh, organizations to utilize your facilities in different ways, the resources and tools that God has uh, gifted you with so that it can be a blessing not only to the church, but be a blessing to the community in which the church should be serving. I love you. Let's pray. 
God, we thank you for the time we shared tonight. Uh, it's been a blessed time. It's been an enriching time. And I do pray uh, it is one that will be not just informative, but application can take place. Touch each household that's represented tonight. All of those have joined us uh, during this time together. Uh, and God, continue to give us innovation so that we can bless your people in new ways that you're continuing to do this new thing. And it shall spring forth because we feel it and we perceive it. Bless and keep us until we meet again. And it's in the miraculous matchless name of Christ we do pray. Amen. Have a blessed remainder of your Wednesday evening. Join us in worship uh, in person or virtually next Sunday morning. Uh, we'll be there June 12th. And can't wait to see you with a smile on your face. I love you. Keep looking up. See you Sunday morning.